Okay, so we finished last week uh, with Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4. And it said, we were lost in the trespasses of our sins. We were dead in the trespasses of sin. But God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive in Christ. And I think that phrase, alive in Christ, is kind of a key to what Ephesians is driving at. We understand being alive day to day. We understand drawing in breath, having feeling in our fingers, having emotions, being hungry. That kind of being alive, we understand. All people understand that. But this is talking about something different than that, something greater, something, I want to say, more personal between us and the creation and the creator, this alive in Christ. We've already been told that this in Christ existence, in the Messiah existence that they're talking about, being alive in Christ, is what God created for. He created creation to be alive in Christ. And what we call being alive, what we normally think of as being alive, is a shadow of that. It is the sinful step cousin, the shaded uh, step cousin of being alive in Christ, what we experience now in a sinful world. And so this is what we are aiming for. I believe eternity, glory, heaven, however you want to call it, will be the full realization of living in Christ. And so it's worth our time to look at that concept. Now, I asked this question last week as we backtrack just a verse or two uh, to pick up where we left off. Is God's wrath toward sin and rebellion the final story? Well, verse 4 answers that, and we just answered that in the title. We were dead in the trespasses of our sin, but God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. Now, that phrase there is trans translated great love. When you look at the word in Greek, it is much more like his great many loves, all the different ways that he loves us, which can't just be put down to one love. And, and the thing is, with a concept like love, people appropriate the word love, and then they read into that word what love means to them. And I would say... The Greek phrase would say, well, that, that's one aspect. What you think love is, that's one or two aspects of God's love. That God loves you in so many ways that you can't even conceive of how you're loved by God. But God, because of his great many ways in which he has loved humanity, loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up. Not only made us alive to live out our life as we will, but has raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly place with Christ Jesus. In a place of honor to sit he has made us alive and raised us up to sit in a place of honor with Christ. In Romans, we had recently, we did on Sunday, it said you'll be glorified as an adopted son, as an adopted child of God. You'll be glorified together with Christ one day. And I've, I've given you the, the analogy of there'll be a great assembly in heaven, how, how, whatever heaven is, however heaven it comes to be. And everybody will be gathered around and they'll say, okay, we have a, our guests of honor are here. Jesus, come on up on stage. Everybody give Jesus a hand. Everybody will be clapping. And they'll say, John Hilker, you come on up with him. And, and we, let's clap for him. They glorified together. 
And people that knew John here on earth will scratch their head and say, well, we're in heaven. We might as well behave. No, I mean, it, it is an amazing thought. I pick it, John, but that's, a, that's unthinkable. And you know what? The irony, the great irony of faith in God and that being glorified together with Christ is that that is the thing, one of the things that drives us sinfully is the need for praise. <clears throat> and what we find is we have to let go of that need and, and replace it with a need to be like Jesus, to love Jesus, to worship Jesus. And if we do that, if we let go <coughs> of our sinful desires here on earth and we make Jesus Lord, then one day, <coughs> excuse me, we will share his glory and be raised up together and sit together in heavenly places with Christ. So mercy, again, just this is review. Mercy is not being given the punishment that you deserve. So God is rich in mercy. God is not quick to punish, punish sin. God is wrathful towards sin. From my wife. Thank you, Linda. You're a saintly woman. Yeah. Or you're tired of hearing me call. I share mine with her. Okay. Yes, yes, I think that's a good plan. Uh, then we said grace. Grace is an undeserved gift. And they're related in God by grace. Undeservedly, you have been saved. Um, and then the third term, raise us up together. That is symbolized in baptism as being come, uh, being put down into death and sin, and coming up a new creation cleaned from sin. So, as I said, God's great love with which he loved us is better translated, or more literally translated, God's great many loves. It has done three things, again, just in review. It has made us alive in Christ. It has raised us up in Christ. And it has made us to sit in heavenly places with Christ. In Romans 4, 17, it said this happened, this salvation, or this happened with Abraham because Abraham believed in God who brings the dead back to life and who creates new things out of nothing. So in this next verse, we get a glimpse of glory looking ahead that in the ages to come, God might show his, the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. You know, I, I truly believe that we walk in a veil of existence. We walk in a fog or a haze. I have used the metaphor before that life in a broken, sinful world is like running into a burning house. And, and so, or living, maybe living your whole life in a burning house, and it is smoky, and you know that it is coming to an end, and there is suffering in there, and you're aware that there are other people in that house, but you can't really communicate well with all the smoke. Uh, and so in... In this sin condition that we're in, this limited awareness of what's happening. So when you're in that smoky house, all you want to do is fix your most immediate need. Um, you are in a panic continually to fix the next need. It's hard to appreciate in this condition the magnitude of our salvation. You know, we get saved and we're overjoyed and there's a change. And then if we're not careful in, in a certain amount of time, we don't think about it anymore. Or we think about it less and less. We can't really, in a sinful condition, fully appreciate. But what this I think this verse is saying is one day we will be able to fully appreciate. One day that veil of sin 
the cloud, the fog of sin will be lifted and we'll be able to see the magnitude of what has happened. These next two verses in Ephesians 2 explain the richness of God's grace to us. Ephesians 2, 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith and not of yourselves, not of your own doing, it is a gift of God, not of works, and we use the word works here a lot in English, so I'm going to try to differentiate them for you. That is ergon. We get energy from ergon. Not of works, ergon, that you have done. Actions, choices that you have made, lest anyone should boast, anyone should be proud that they are saved. For we are God's workmanship. And that word is poiema. And that is sort of like his doings. That word is also his creation. We are his creation. A uh, uh, thing he, which he made might be a, a literal translation of poiema. For we are the things that he has made. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. I might say recreated. We were created once into sin and when we get saved by grace through faith as a gift of God, we are recreated in Christ. Created in Christ for good works, good ergon. So notice that. Created in Christ is bookend. By works. You did not get in Christ by doing works, but you have been recreated now in order so that you do good works. Which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Christ, Jesus creation, what we are now, is God's intention. From the beginning. That's why I say in Christ may very well be what was in the Garden of Eden, living in Christ, and may very well be what we do in heaven for eternity. Uh, another way of looking at what we will be doing. So salvation is grace alone, but to receive that grace, we must believe God. We must make the choice that this is the truth. We, must, we call that having faith. So I believe faith, over and over, as I look at what the Bible says about faith, there's not a verse that I'm pulling from where it says, okay, faith is made up of belief and action. But as I see, as I view it, so I want to give you that uh, so you can, so you can uh, track where I'm getting what I say from, and that is, when I view the way faith is used and the way belief is used, I believe that faith is made up of what you believe and then what you do according to that belief. So it's two parts. One is spiritual and one is active. And I believe when your spirit, spiritual, spiritual choice and your action agree, then you have faith in whatever it is. Um, it, and that... Whatever you might have faith in, you have to do, uh, have that two part. In Romans 3, 22 and 23, talking about this sin, we are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. We believe, what that means is we believe that his death on the cross paid for our sins, uh, and then we make him Lord. That is our action. We begin living under his lordship, making choices and acting. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All right? In other words, everybody is dealt the same hand in life. We are truly equal. There are two ways we are equal. We are created in the image of God, all people. 
and then we sin and we're all out of the image of God. And so there's nobody with an advantage over anyone else. But what makes us saved? It is our faith in the truth of the cross. Faith is a belief and then make, confessing him as Lord. Is it enough to believe in Jesus? Is that all it takes? What's it saying, James, John? You have to repent. Right. What, 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 what did you say? What did I said, you what's it saying, James? It says belief is not enough. Even the de demons believe. Yeah. You've got to make him Lord. Okay. You've got to make him Lord. And so, yes, you're right. You have to repent. I say that's part of a true belief, but that might be, that might be, you know, depending on how you want to define the terms, that might be an active, an active thing. Um, we believe, and then when we confess him as Lord, what that means is we, we give our life to him. And it's two parts. And that was James's point. Faith without works, which if my definition is correct, is just a belief that Jesus' death will do, would save you. Without works is dead, meaning you have not made Jesus Lord. You believe that his death is the way, but you haven't made him Lord. You're not going to live for him. And so that's only half the equation. Uh, and sin is what separates us from God. To be re-separated, you have to believe and you have to confess Jesus as Lord and live your life for him. Now, it is not a scorecard, and that's what's hard for humanity. Giving your life to Christ is not a scorecard. You know, in Islam, uh, I have been told, this, so this is second or third hand knowledge, they talk about the, the magic 51 or something like that. That might not be the right term. But you want 51% of your actions to be good. Because there is a scorecard in Islam. And the thing, one of the really sad things about Islam they believe in one all-powerful creator, God, but there is no mode of salvation in Islam. There is nothing you can do to guarantee that you get to go to heaven, except, except die trying to kill people who don't believe, <laughs> to die in a holy war. And, and what is tricky about that is that an imam, which is a religious leader, and I'm not exactly sure, I'm not extremely well versed on Islam, so I may get something incorrect, but an, an imam is a religious leader, but an imam can declare a holy war. They say, uh, uh, Allah told me that if you attack this group, you know, if you kill them, if you, if you, then if you get killed in the process of killing them, for example, with a bomb, if you strap, if, if I'm an imam declares war against Israel, which is, which is continually done, uh, and you go and blow up some Israelites, then you have died killing unbelievers, infidels. That's the only guarantee to go to heaven. Not only that, but millionaire and billionaire Muslims send money to your family if you blow yourself up killing people. Um, and so it is, a, it, is a, it is a hopeless religion. So they try to be really good people. They put a premium on being good. Uh, and they try to get 51% because they feel like if you're 51% good, then it is very likely. All right, it's hopeful. They hope that maybe... Allah will favor you and let you go into heaven. And so the guys who ran their plane into the World Trade Center, if my understanding is correct, they were not religious men. They believed uh, they didn't do many actions. So they were rather hopeless. They knew that they were well below 51% good actions. And they knew that they could spend the rest of their life doing good and probably not get up to 51%. So what did they do? They took the option of crashing the plane and killing infidels, even though they also killed a lot of Muslims too. So they, 
I'm not, I'm telling you what I know about this. I am in no way saying that it holds water. Um, I, I sure would not want to trust that an imam is tied in with God enough to declare a correct holy war to get me into heaven. I mean, even if I thought the system was good, you are relying on a subjective truth of another human being in order to get in. So anyway, my point my point in all of this is that we have a trustworthy mode. We understand what our mode of salvation is. God says, if you believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins and you declare him as Lord, he is faithful and just to forgive your sins. All right? That is an A, B, C mode of salvation that we are putting our faith in. And we have eternal hope. And so I, that is the reason that Christ, Christianity, that when, when in history Christians have killed other people for religious purposes, we can look at that and say, that's unchristian behavior. We are peaceful people. The truth is, from what I have read, if you read the, the writings of Muhammad and the way that they unpack their scripture, uh, killing non-believers and dying in the process is part of what Muhammad is a correct interpretation of the Quran. And the peaceful writings that, that he wrote earlier in his ministry are superseded by the later commands to declare jihad. And so the peaceful sects of Islam are the ones that are not obeying the Quran. And the radicals are the ones that aren't. So anyway, that's enough about that's enough about Islam. But we should pray for Islamic people. I believe their religious system does not give them a mode of salvation the best they can do. Uh, is do a revenge killing against unbelievers. That's the only hope they have. Uh, what is surprising is that more don't do it. But we have hope. God and God loves all people. There is no Arabic Islamic person that is more deserving of salvation than me or less deserving because sin is the great equalizer. But God has blessed all nations. He told Abraham, through you I will bless all nations. And he has made the cross available to anybody who call on the name of the Lord. And they can be from Arabia. They can be from Valdez. Doesn't matter to God. If you call on the cross, he is faithful and just. If you believe and you declare him as your Lord, he is faithful and just and it says the Holy Spirit seals us as a guarantee of our salvation. This is the thing. And Paul says this flat out. Either Christianity is the one way to God or it's no way at all. And so anybody that calls them, tries to call themselves a Christian and says that there are many pathways to God don't know what the Bible says. Or are willfully rejecting the Bible. You know, Joel Osteen told that to what you just said to Larry King. Yeah, I believe we talked about that one time. And so it, I have seen a couple things from Joel Osteen that surprised me. He's an apostate. And unfortunately, the things that surprised me about Joel Osteen were when he said the truth. And it's only been about twice, two, about two things I've yeah. heard. Um, but that's what the Bible tells us. Either there's one way to God, and that is through the cross, or there's no way to God. Or that Christianity is not a way. Just real quick about Joe Osteen, you know, I, I think I've told you this. I learned at Bob Jones at graduate school that the worst form of error in Arabic is the truth, because there's enough truth to make it palatable, but yet there's underlying errors that we're about. Yeah, yeah, it's true. It's true. It's true. All right, so let's 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 vote right now. Everybody wants to stay with the Bible, raise your hand. All right, that's a hundred percent. 
I'm counting everybody. Uh, it goes on in in Romans 3.25, for God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. We've been through parts of the Old Testament. You go through the whole Old Testament. Everything in there is in there for a reason. It talks a lot about the sacrifices. It talks positively about how we need to stick with the sacrifices, the prescribed sacrifices, so that we're not making up our own religion. We're not making our own pathway to God. And then later it criticizes people who said, well, I can do these acts of devotion, make sacrifices, then I can believe whatever I want to. And so it criticizes them. Uh, uh, obedience is better than sacrifice, it says. Because obedience is what's in your heart. And it's not just what you do. Always, 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 cover to cover in the Bible, uh, faith is what you is believing God and making him Lord. Uh, and that goes all the way through the end. So you can't, you can't not believe and just act like you believe and do the religion. That's no good. And you can't believe God but then do what you want with your life. You've got to make him Lord and try to live a life that is pleasing to him. It's two parts. So God presented Jesus as the sacrifice, the once and for all sacrifice, it says in Hebrews, for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood, fulfilling the Old Testament. Um, that goes straight to Numbers 35, 25. Is it 25 or 22? It says... Atonement cannot be made for bloodshed on the ground except by the blood of him who shed. And here Jesus shed his blood in payment for the blood that we had shed on the ground to make atonement for, for man and God. It says in Galatians 2.16, Yet we know that a person is made right with God by faith in Jesus Christ, not by obeying the law, Okay, so here obeying law is the action. That's making Lord, that's acting, doing the religion. But it's uh, made right with God by faith in Jesus Christ, not just by doing. We have believed in Jesus Christ, that's a spiritual aspect, so that we might be made right with God because of our faith in Christ, not because we have obeyed the law, for no one will ever be made right with God just, I would add, just by obeying the law, by obeying the law. It's two part. In 1 Peter 1, 5, it says, through your faith, God is protecting you by his power until you receive this salvation, which is ready to be revealed on the last day for all to see. All right, now that's an interesting verse. And what that's talking about, there are different, uh, in my understanding, there are different phases of our salvation. I believe it was J. Vernon McGee that said, when we ask Jesus in our heart, we are saved from the penalty of sin. That is, we get to go to heaven when we die rather than to the lake of fire. He said, we are saved from the power of sin. And what he means by that is, before salvation, we kind of have a hard time saying no to sin. We live in a sin nature. We crave sin, and to sin, it jives with our nature. But when we get saved, I hope it hurts your feelings when you sin. If it don't hurt your feelings to sin, that might be a clue you ain't saved. We are saved from the power of sin. We have the choice to say no to sin once we are saved. Now, we, that don't mean we will. It just means we have the choice. It sort of means that we're more responsible for our sinning than a lost person. If I do the same thing as the lost person, I am more accountable for what I do because I surrendered uh, to sin, and he just went with his sin nature. He, went, he did what was natural for him. But what we are not saved from is the presence of sin. So that's three Ps. Penalty and power, yes. Presence, no. We will walk not only in a sinful world with sin all around us. 
sin happening to us every day. But we also walk around in our flesh. And again, you know, from weeks past, I've said flesh, I think, is our physical body and our desires, hunger, all the desires we have, thirst, tired, anything. Uh, our emotions, both positive and negative, are, are conditioned by sin. Uh, and our intellect, what we think about, the way we process information is conditioned by sin. That is our flesh. Those three parts are our flesh. And our soul is our spirit that is unique to us. Okay, so there's the spirit of God breathed in us that makes us living. All people have that spirit, that aspect of the spirit of God. And then each person has their own personality, which is unique. That personality will go, will, will continue after death. That is our soul. It's nephesh in um, Hebrew, and it is um, pneumatos. Well, is it pneumatos? Never mind. I can't. I can't remember in Greek. Anyway. That soul is inside that sinful body. I believe when we are regenerated, that our soul is regenerated, but that our flesh, and they, they are intertwined with one another, flesh and soul, and our flesh does it, continues to crave sin as it did before. And so that's where salvation is done outside of us by God. All we do, at best, all that we do in salvation, before salvation, is we listen to what the Holy Spirit tells us, that we are sinful and there's no other way to God. We don't know that by ourselves. And we say, you know, he's, he's right. The Holy Spirit's right. Jesus is my only hope of salvation. I better surrender to that. And when we do that, God does all the saving. Come in and does all the saving. Regenerates our soul. Everything. Then we begin a process at that point. And that's where the actions, the work, comes into play. After we are saved, then we begin cooperating with the Holy Spirit. Listening to God about actions we should take. Habits we should form. We have to retrain every aspect of our flesh. Whether it's physical habits, emotional habits, intellectual thinking, what we read, what we look at on the billboards, what we look at in the stores, what we look at on the computer screen. We have to retrain everything. And I don't believe, nobody's told me that you're ever too old to, that, you can stop, that you can stop retraining your mind. I believe those desires, we keep finding desires for our whole life that disappoint God and that are sinful and we need to work at. That's called sanctification. And that is a cooperative effort between us and the Holy Spirit in trying to not sin, trying to retrain our flesh not to crave and do sinful things. And so I think that's what this, I think that's what this verse is referring to. The salvation which is ready to be revealed on the last day for all to see, that will be the removal from the presence of sin. And as I said with my analogy earlier about the, the smoking house or the veil of sin, I think when we stand before God, lost and saved, that sin will be lifted from our eyes so that everybody can see the truth. And I believe, I, I believe, it's a red flag. When I say I believe, I'm saying if I step away from Scripture and I'm making, I might be making some up in my own mind, so be aware of that. But I believe that's why there will be the gnashing of teeth. People will, re everybody that day will realize I do not deserve to be saved. My life has not been, I did nothing to commend me to God, to make me worthy of salvation. Jesus, is, Jesus was said, I knew this one, 
Uh, I, am, I imparted my righteousness on him. So when you look at this person, you look at my sinfulness. And then we'll get to go in. And the lost people will gnash their teeth because they said, you know what? I was told and told I was too busy working. I was engaged in some sinful activity and I knew that if I accepted Jesus, I'd have to stop. So I did and I just kept putting it off, putting it off. Whatever the excuse will be. And they will just grind their teeth because they will say, you know what? I knew, I knew and I did nothing. I waited and I waited and my time is gone. And that's what I think it's saying. Through faith, God is protecting you by his power, holding your salvation, sealing your salvation. And this is another example of a verse why I insist that once you are saved, you are always saved, you can't unsave. Because to me, if I step back and just logically think, if we could lose our salvation, eventually you get to the point where basically every time you sin, you're unsaved again. If, that's, if it's possible to lose that salvation, this idea of some, some sins count more than others, not to God, that's an infringement on God's holiness. He, he, God is protecting you by his power. Once you have asked Jesus into your heart and you've declared, I want to try to live my life for you every day. I declare you as Lord and I want to try. He protects you with his power until you receive salvation from the presence of sin. Until the day you don't have to deal with sin anymore. He is protecting you. Work with him. Do not work against him. Uh, which is ready to be revealed on the last day for all to see. That's the way I would go with that verse. So again, by faith we are saved not by works. Romans 3.20, for no one can ever be made right with God by doing what the law of Moses commands. Isn't that funny? He, Paul says in other places, listen, there are too many laws. Nobody can keep all of the laws. You can keep some of them. You can't keep all of them. Only one messing up on one law disqualifies you from heaven. Nobody can do it. He said the only reason for the law is to let you know that you have to rely on Jesus for salvation. That nobody, not the most devout rabbinical Jew of all times, can rely solely on the law and being obedient to get them into heaven. Even everybody has to come to God by faith, not by works. The law simply shows us how sinful we are. So we're made right with God through faith, not by obeying the law. No wonder we feel bad about things. We were born into sin. Then we get reborn into Christ. It makes sense to me that a saved person is going to be dissatisfied with life in the flesh. All the reasons I said. I, I think that it is painful uh, to be regenerated and to continue to sin. So let's look at some verses about God's work. In Romans 14, 20, don't tear apart the work of God over what you eat. So this is, in this scripture uh, in Romans, Paul is talking about the practice of going and, and buying meat from the temples that was sacrificed to God. And it was cheaper to go buy sacrificed meat because they needed to get rid of it. And in the ancient world, they couldn't refrigerate, so they had to get rid of meat fast. When they would do the elaborate ceremonies and sacrifice bulls, they needed to sell that meat quick. At the butchers, they would sacrifice according to how long the line was. At the temple, they would sacrifice according to what the ritual called for. And they needed to get rid of the meat quick. So the meat was cheaper, if I understand correctly, at the temples than at the butchers. And so that got to be a, a squabble once Christianity came in, in Rome and Ephesus and different places, metropolitan, cosmopolitan places. 
Some Christians would say, if you eat that meat, sacrificed to a pagan god, then you are apostate. You are betraying God. Paul said, he's like, those gods are dead. They don't exist. There's only one God. And so how can eating meat, sacrificed to a dead thing, affect you spiritually? However, he said, if, if your buddy over here gets really upset to know that you're eating meat sacrificed to a God, and it makes him question his faith for you to eat that meat in front of him, don't do it. So that's the gist of this scripture. He says, don't tear apart the work of God over what you eat. So what is the work of God in that buddy who is saved? The salvation. The spiritual work that God does. And he said, don't, don't mess. Or, for example, what if somebody is under conviction and thinking very seriously about accepting Christ and you say, okay, I'm going to eat meat sacrificed to an idol. And they say, well, apparently salvation doesn't mean anything to him. I'm not going to do it. Don't tear apart the work of God over what you eat. Remember, all foods are acceptable to God, but it is wrong to eat something if it makes another person stumble. And we could, you know, we could, uh, a very easy thing to insert here, a very easy concept would be alcohol. Uh, don't tear apart the work of God over what you drink. Remember, all drinks are acceptable. I'm going to put a parenthesis in moderation. But it is wrong to drink something if it makes another person stumble. Right there is what the Bible has to say about it. You, just because you think it's okay don't mean you can run roughshod over other people. That is, this is an attitude uh, that Je you want to have the attitude that Jesus carried to the cross. And that was an overwhelming love for the sinner, not an arrogance about, well, I can do whatever I want to because I'm the son of God. All right, Philippians 1.6, I'm certain that God, who began the good work in you, will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ returns. Again, this is spiritual work. God is working in us spiritually, and he will continue until the end of time. So believers are God's specific spiritual Poiema, that which is made, his spiritual creation, his spiritual recreation, and we are made for good works or good actions. So imagine someone, and this is just a thought exercise, imagine someone who is completely destitute. They have no source of income, no way to get food, uh, and it's hard to imagine this in our modern society. And I go to them and I say, listen, I'm going to pay every one of your bills for the rest of your life. I'm going to buy you food. I'm going to pay your rent. Uh, if you need transportation, I'll pay for that. Everything. I will give everything to this destitute person. Uh, yet, they refuse to thank me. And when asked, why don't you thank Rex for paying all your bills... They say, I once gave Rex a dollar, so we're even Stephen. And so when we try to be good in order to get salvation, we're doing something. That's an exaggerated example. But that's, that's basically what we do to God when we say, you know what, I've been a pretty good person. We're giving, we're giving back a nothing, a dollar, for in, in exchange, we think, for eternity. Uh, and it is preposterous when you view it that way, to try to, to do being religious. I, I, I've been good. I've gone to church every week, whatever the religion. I've given money. I've served. I'm fine. It's preposterous. It doesn't begin to compare with the salvation that's being given to us. Good works 
should be the product of salvation, not to pay for salvation. That would be works before salvation. Or once we are saved, to say we're paying God back by being good. We're paying God back by being good. Any questions about that? I think that'll be a good place to stop for today. We we got we didn't get too far today, but that's okay. We're not in a hurry. If anybody gets impatient to rush forward through Ephesians, whisper in my ear, and I'll try to speed up a little bit. Uh, I'm finding Ephesians to be a very rich book and full of good things. Any questions or comments about these concepts we talked about today? All right, let's say a prayer and be close.